For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bethany Gaunt and I am Associate Director of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre. The centre was created five years ago as a way of continuing the extraordinary, extraordinary legacy of Sir Martin Gilbert and we ensure that our programme of events reflects the wide ranging topics of Sir Martin's work. Luckily, we have a wealth of subject areas to choose from because over the course of his career, Sir Martin wrote 88 books on 20th century topics, including the World Wars, the Holocaust and Sir Winston Churchill. We invite speakers whose own research demonstrates the same clarity and precision evident in Sir Martin's work, as well as the same ability to engage and appeal to wide audiences. I'm very happy to say that tonight's guest very much fits the bill. Before I introduce our speaker, I would just want to say that we are a charity and we rely on donations. If you would like to support our work, it is easy to donate on our website and I will add the link to the chat in a moment. We're extremely grateful for your kind support. <clears throat> so, on to tonight's guest. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Beatriz Pichel. Beatriz is Associate Professor at the Photographic History Research Centre at De Montfort University in the UK. Her research interests include the history of war, the history of medicine and the history of the body, all of which emerged to various degrees in her 2021 monograph Picturing the Western Front, Photography, Practices and Experiences in First World War France. Tonight, Beatrice has kindly agreed to answer a number of questions that emerged from my reading of her book. And if that whets your appetite, I would encourage you to buy a copy of her book, which is published by Manchester University Press. You'll see that my copy is full of notes which of things that I found very interesting, so I really would encourage you to do that. I'll post a link in the chat. Beatriz is currently working on a new project entitled Photography and the Making of the Medical Sciences in France, 1860 to 1914, which will be published by Palgrave. I have the privilege of reading a lot of books by many talented researchers for my role at the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre, often delving into subject areas with which I am fairly unfamiliar. Picturing the Western Front was one such journey into the unknown for me. I consume photography and like almost all smartphone users, I take photographs, but I had not previously had the opportunity to consider the nuances of war photography in any depth. And while it is always a pleasure to learn about something new, it is an even greater pleasure when the book you are reading is clear, engaging and brilliantly written. So first of all, Beatrice, thank you for writing such an eminently readable academic book which is in itself no mean feat. <laughs> so, as I said, tonight's event is going to take the form of an extended Q&A session between myself and Beatriz, which should hopefully touch on all the fascinating topics covered in Picturing the Western Front. After about 40 to 45 minutes, we'll open the floor to your questions. And you can, as always, message questions to me directly or put them in the group chat. So I think we'll kick off. Now, Beatriz, thank you so much for joining us today. As I said, I found your book to be wonderfully engaging and really clearly written. And I wondered if we could just begin by hearing about how you got into this area of research. Thank you so much, Bethany, for such a generous reading and such an amazing um, introduction and for saying my name <laughs> correctly. <laughs> Um, thank you everyone for coming here from so many parts of the world. I'm really, really delighted to be here today. Um, so I, I really like that you started, you know, with the question of how I got into this, how I got into this field of research, because I think for me, the journey to this book is, it's been quite important. So um, in case you don't notice by my accent, I'm not British, I'm from Spain, and I did my undergraduate degree and my PhD back in Spain and Madrid, um, and actually my degree was in philosophy, <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> and I specialized in the history of sciences, history of medicine, and while I was doing like my master's, um, I was with my supervisor, like discussing topics for my 
master's dissertation for my PhD. And we wanted to do something about first world war related to death, but we didn't really know what to do. Um, and my supervisor said, why don't you look at photographs? So again, with my philosophy background, I went into an archive, I was in Paris that year, so I just booked a visit to an archive that had um, personal world photographs. And I loved it. I just loved it immediately. The first second that I started like opening drawers and see the prints and the personal albums. I don't know, it was like completely different from anything that I've done before. And I really loved what I did. <laughs> um, so... I say, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll start digging into photography. And I start reading on the history of photography and photographic theory. Um, and I saw a way to integrate like all my interest in, you know, technology and science, but also more like cultural history and what people do and feel and believe, think this kind of things. Um, so by the end of my PhD, it was very clear to me that I really, that photographic history was really my field. Um, and now, as you say, I'm at the Photographic History Center. I teach photographic history. That's kind of my main discipline now. Um, but yeah, it took me, um, you know, it wasn't a straightforward line. And I think that is interesting too. And I think that is reflected in the kind of issues that I deal with um, in my research. Yeah, definitely. I love that passion that you, it comes out in your book for the photographs themselves, the actual objects, which, which is fascinating. Um, and probably leading nicely on from that, my second question is about the titles mm -hmm. of the five chapters in your book. So they're all verbs that you connect with photography. Uh, so chapter one is recording, chapter two, feeling, chapter three, embodying, chapter four, placing, and the final chapter, making visible and invisible. Um, I found this a really unusual but stimulating and effective way of organizing your material. And so I wondered how you had arrived at those categories. Thank you. So I, I thank you already for this question. <laughs> um, but I think... Um, for me, it was a key question, and um, I'm really glad that someone pick up, pick up on that. Um, obviously, you know, it was a struggle to, because this was first my PhD, and then it has changed a lot for the book. Um, and at the beginning, I was kind of organizing everything by topics, so I had like official photography, amateur photography, landscapes, uh, bodies, these kind of things, right? Um, but then I realized that actually I wasn't really talking about that. Yeah, I was talking about um, um, official photography, for instance, but it was because they were recording and because they, the aim of this uh, new uh, photographic service was to record everything that had to do with the war and these kind of things. And actually I kept thinking about that because my aim with this book and with all my book is always to talk about photography as a practice, as something that we do. And I'm interested in what happens when we do photography, when we take a picture, when we look at a picture, when we come back to it, when we publish them all these kind of things. So actually I realized that it was the actions that really interest me rather than the topic of it. And that there were obviously overlaps in those categories. So um, if I was talking about um, recording, it's not just official photography, amateur photographers were also recording in a different way, in a kind of different sense. Um, so I realized that actually what brought all the topics together were the photographic practices, the different ways in which they use photography and what they, the different things that they were doing when they were taking pictures, looking at pictures and so on. Um, and that linked really nicely to one of the main questions of the book, that it was the relationship between photography and experience. Because um, 
when we talk about experience, it seems like very intuitive, right? We all know what an experience is. Um, but when we go into the academic debates, <laughs> it gets really tricky to actually define what we mean exactly by experience and how we access experience of the past. Um, and all the things that I read were based on language, on written accounts and oral accounts or memory and so on. And I realized that actually, if I was focusing on these photographic practices, I was looking at experience from a practical point of view. That they were, when they were recording photographs, when they were um, uh, emotionally bonding with others through photography, all these kind of things, they were shaping their own war experiences. Um, so hopefully that's, you know, that's clear in the book. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, that definitely comes out. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, we hear in your book about the proliferation of photography both at home and on the front lines, um, which you explain is largely down to the increased portability of cameras in the early 20th century. Uh, could you tell us a little about these innovative camera models and how companies such as Kodak actively pitch their products at soldiers themselves? Yes, uh, another of my favorite questions. <laughs> um, so obviously photography was readily available by 1914. No, it was invented in 1839. So by 1914, everyone had seen photographs. Um, newspapers, magazine books were illustrated with photographs. Uh, most people who had been sitting for a photograph or buying a photograph or someone. Um, and there were portable cameras already. But um, and I have one of those. Yes. <laughs> um, so Kodak, um, who were already producing a lot of these cameras, who um, the difference with this camera with the previous ones is that these are completely portable, the small ones, and they work with film instead of glass blades. So you can um, carry it with you. And what is more important, you don't need any technical knowledge about photography. So with the glass plates, with the big ones, you need no knowledge about how to use the plates. You need knowledge about developing the negatives. You need knowledge about like all the camera settings. With this one, it comes preloaded. When you finish your film, just send it back <laughs> and that's it. And it just comes with a really few settings. So this one, oops. And I'll put it next to the camera. Yeah, it looks quite modern. So it's 1914-15. This is what's called the Kodak Best Pocket. So um, it's exactly the same as the other Kodak cameras, but Kodak decided that actually this was a really good marketing opportunity. And, and Kodak were the best, the best at, <laughs> at marketing at the time. Um, so they started advertising this camera as the best parting gift for the soldier, for instance. Um, and they started to say in the advertisement that, you know, if you go to the war, you can write down your memories in the, your diary or your letters. But actually, if you take pictures and then you collect them in your Kodak album, you can then tell your story of the war to your kids and grandkids, and it will be like a more vivid picture of it. Um, so something that they introduced at the time. So um, if you, to use it, you need to look through this. So it will be something like this and then click here. Um, I don't know if you can see it, yeah. but um, something that I find really cute and I love about this camera is that it has this little feature, which is the autographic feature. There's this little tab that you release and here you can kind of think, put some things that inscriptions on the film. So when you develop it, you say like a date or a name or something. So it's like a very That's fascinating thing. Um, so yeah, this is the Kodak Best Pocket, called Best Pocket because it fed, it fit into your pocket. <laughs> So it, it's a really early version of, is it called a point and shoot camera where literally all you have to do is just hold it and press a button? One of the first of that variety. 
Yeah, so yeah. they had others that were like little boxes that mm -hmm. had no technical, you know, no, no settings. Mm -hmm. So it's basically um, their, um, their slogan was, you press the button, we do the rest. Very good. <laughs> That's <laughs> very simple. Or like all the Kodak advertisements, like um, they were like with women and children because it was so easy that even women could do oh. it. <laughs> I'm glad advertising has moved on in some way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, this camera was like, was around from since 1913. So it's not like it's invented for the war. Mm -hmm. um, but they saw the opportunity to market it as something especially good for soldiers. And yeah. it was, yeah, um, it was very popular at the time. It yeah. sold very well. <laughs> Having read the book, it's lovely to see you holding the tiny little camera in real life. Yeah. That's very, <laughs> very cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, so now that we've got all these Kodak vest pocket cameras and everything in, uh, in circulation during the First World War, uh, in your book, you discuss the potential perils of this widespread use of cameras and photography from the Western Front, um, which is obviously the inadvertent sharing of military positions or the potential hampering of military campaigns. Um, could you talk to us about how the French government managed this amateur and professional photography of the war to avoid these risks? Yeah, so first of all, I saw in the chat a comment about whether the camera was expensive. Yeah. It was not. It was not like super cheap, um, but it was cheap. It was not expensive at all. There were more expensive cameras anyway. So I think that is a great question because um, obviously at the beginning of the war, um, they didn't realize, at least from the French side, they didn't realize the power of photography. It was just you know, as the month went by, um, they started to realize actually phot photographs are circulating a lot. Um, and we can see the photographs taken by the Germans and our photographs are seen by the allies and the Germans and other neutral countries and so on. So they realized that actually they needed to control the production of photographs, not just as you say, because they could reveal military information. So a photograph, um, they can reveal in the background a position that they don't want to, you know, uh, reveal or a particular weapon or something like that. So strategically, military, um, it was a day, it was a risk, but also in terms of morale and in terms of, you know, support for the war. Um, because um, as I say, these photographs travel internationally. So they were mm -hmm. really, really concerned about what the neutral countries thought of France. Um, so the first thing that they did in between March and May 1915 was to create their own photographic service, their own military photographic service um, called the Section Photographique de l'Armée, literally the military photographic service. Um, and that was a really big innovation. So for instance, the British, is, they start to hire photographers here and there to send them to some missions, especially from 1916. But France creates a whole photographic service. So they hire several photographers. I think at some point there are like 17 of them. They hire photographers, they hire laboratory technicians to do all the developing, all the printing, enlargement, every all the operations in the lab. And obviously, I conditioned some labs for that. They also hire archivists, usually women, to go through the prints, to catalog them and classify them. Um, so it is a whole system of photography to control from the taking of the photographs to the printing, the classification. They send them to the neutral countries, to allies. Um, they publish it in their own um, publications. They publish it. In, in postcards, they do exhibitions at schools, all of this kind of thing. So this is about controlling the circulation of photography. Um, and in terms of the amateur photography, um, they try to restrict the use of photography in military zones. So in kind of near the front lines, because obviously mm -hmm. the Western Front 
goes for so long that there are still populations that are kind of near that. Um, and they ask them to, if they want to use photographs, they need to apply for a permit and say who they are, the cameras that they have. Many say that they have the Kodak <laughs> camera um, and what they're gonna do with them. And they um, basically, they have to say that it's for personal use, that they're not gonna send it to the press, send it anywhere, anywhere else, it's just for them. And they're gonna keep all the copies. So this was <laughs> in theory. In <laughs> practice, actually, uh, many of these, um, amateurs just send the photographs to the press because they wanted like very um, flashy images of the war and they you know it was the opportunity to get published they don't get credit because mm -hmm. the press never say this comes from this person <laughs> but I guess seeing your work in the press might be enough uh, reward um, so yeah they try to do that and then with the official photographer photographers, they send it to specific zones with military officers. Um, but again, it's really difficult to control. Like, it's really difficult to control that the photographer was always with the officer and only photographing what the military officer wanted. Um, so what I find really interesting is that even if they're trying to really control photography, in practice, it doesn't work mm -hmm. because <clears throat> it can't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at the end of the day, people will always try and do their own thing, won't they? Exactly. <laughs> but I do find it really interesting and it emerges very clearly in your book that officially France was very consciously constructing an archive of photography about the war for, for future reference. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah, and they literally say this is for the future historian to see the exact image of the war. So it is this um, so I find it really fascinating, especially the fact that they have an, the archive. And actually, um, when they established this whole service, they have three aims. Um, one is propaganda aim, which is, you know, fair enough, the one that we all think about. But they also have as a name to document all the um, destruction of the heritage so they can then um, kind of map the destruction of like buildings, churches, monuments, things like that, so they can repair that in the mm -hmm. future. And then to construct the archives and all the photographs end up in the archives. So it's this kind of, yeah, this idea of they're trying to get a picture of the war through pictures. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really fascinating. Yeah. Th yeah, and then the classifications they get into, it's just, <laughs> yeah. I imagine a bit of a minefield. <laughs> um, you include a few photographs in the book, which is lovely. Uh, and I really enjoyed the ones that you picked out. Uh, some of my favorites were the ones where, as you write, they domesticate the front lines. So we see the more uh, quotidian side of warfare with soldiers at leisure, cooking and eating, not necessarily typical war photo or what you'd think of as war photography but the sort of social element of war um can you explain the role of photography in this taming of the war front and i'll just point out for the audience that uh, the photo on the front cover which has been in our advertising as well comes under this definition i think of domesticating the front lines um can you tell us a bit about this image which is quite funny <laughs> <laughs> yes so um i got a few pictures I think you Brilliant. can, yeah, you can see it. So one is the cover of the book um, with the regional colors. And the other one is um, a photograph that I talk about in the book, but I couldn't publish. So at least you get to see it yeah. now. Um, Brilliant. So I, I love the photograph in the cover and I pick it up for the cover for several reasons. One is that I love it. <laughs> um, also, Due to ethical reasons, I didn't want like a body or something like that um, because I find that very sensitive to work with. So I, I wasn't comfortable putting that on the cover of the book. Mm -hmm. um, but also I think that it is this kind of moments that really um, highlight the power of photography and why photography matter during, you know, during the war. Um, 
for instance, with the photograph of the cover, you can see it's a man uh, that is holding two of the men, and that's one coming from behind. Um, that is an amateur photograph. There's a personal photograph. Um, so it is someone photographing their friends. Mm -hmm. And I think we all have this kind of experience, right, of like doing silly things in front of a camera because you're among friends. And what I find really fascinating is that the the joke is not just that one is strong enough to hold two other men. The joke is also performing it for the camera. Yeah. Like they're in the middle of the field. There's a chair behind them. It's completely posed. It's not a quick snap, you know, like they are very aware of that. They're posing for that. And I think that, you know, as silly as it is, that is a way of bonding. And that is a way to, of demonstrating the um, the feelings for each other in a time where, you know, it, it matters a lot. Yeah. On the other on the other image is another um, amateur photograph that um, it's come from uh, the albums made by Mrs. Allison, who was a British lady who opened uh, three hospitals in France for convalescent soldiers. And as you can see, it is a group of convalescent soldiers so they're recovering um, from something but they are all dressed in female clothes and if you look at it they're not, they're dressed in uniforms in mm -hmm. nurses uniforms they are so they're wearing the clothes of the women who are taking care of them and this is all part of the fun it's all part of the joke they're posing for it it's not just a performance of you know I guess they were in kind of putting like a theater or something like that they're also smiling to the camera all of them they have some photographs also with the nurses so I think again that is a way of bonding that is a way um of feeling and may, that is what you know where the um the feelings were enacted really um and I think something similar with the photographs that you say about like cooking and showering and doing the dishes and I find that fascinating because by 1914 um, family photography is already a thing so people already have some cameras and usually with family photography you photograph the special locations right mm -hmm. you photograph um, and now you will photograph weddings and graduations and things like that but I, back at the time the same you especially if you have only like you know 36 um, photographs um you photograph these special occasions but during the war there's like a inversion of the codes um and you photograph you, you know they they all photograph others cooking doing the dishes showering fishing because that becomes something exceptional they are the doing at the trenches you know um having a hot meal having a shower it's not taken for granted. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a way to celebrate the extraordinary, which is, you know, being able to cook and to wash yourself, but also a way to say, you, you know, we're making it homely. We are taking care of ourselves and we, we can live here. Um, which I think it's a very human thing. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely. Thank you. They're lovely photos. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in So moving on to something quite different now, a very different type of photograph that you include in the book, uh, in your embodying chapter. So you discuss the photography of injured soldiers, which I suppose must be of interest for you because of your your um, research into the history of medicine and the history of bodies um, and you talk about the distinction between the way in which photography contributed to the rehabilitation of, of amputees for example uh, the ph photographs focused on their adapt adaptation their ability to work and their resulting reintegration to society and the sort of very different way in which photography of facial injustice injuries was used could you explain that for us yes so i'm going to show a picture only of the amputees because the mm -hmm. facial injuries 
are a lot. Yes, um, they are. <laughs> they are. Yeah. Um, so just to say that the next picture is a bit upsetting, um, even if it's not like graphic. Um, so yeah, I, I find that there is a very different way in which, you know, um, bodily amputations and injuries and fa facial amputations and injuries were treated and were photographed and the photographs work in very different ways. Um, so this is one of the photographs uh, taken by official photographers of two um, amputees at a, at a rehabilitation school. And as you can see, they are both, they both have prosthetic arms, but they're not, they don't look like arms. They don't look like human flesh and a human um, hand. They're tools, they're working tools. And there are other photographs with all the different prosthetic arms with different tools. Um, and the idea, and this um, Roxanne uh, Pantasi has a wonderful article about this. Um, is the idea that um, amputees can recover, um, can rehabilitate through work. And so work will make them uh, productive, which will help with the emotional rehabilitation and emotional recovery too. Um, so especially with, um, with arms, but also with legs, um, all these processes won't one try to pass as normal human arms. So the aesthetic aim is not there. It's just the function. They want to recover the function, not recover the aesthetics. With facial injuries, it is a bit different because um, the function is not easy to recover. For instance, the chewing and the swallowing and things like that, yeah, or even the eyes, you know, um, it's not easy to recover. And the aesthetics isn't easy to recover either, because there are often a lot of the scars, for instance. The use of, of prosthetic device isn't easy either, because um, they're not they're not used to recover a function, to replace the function of a hand, for instance. It would be just to hide the damage mm -hmm. um so for instance there was this um wonderful artist anna coleman lad who did really beautiful um mask but they look like mask so mm -hmm. they draw attention to the issue so it is because this um different ideas of trying to recover the function or trying to recover the aesthetics that the amputees became really visible in French visual culture. So this is a photograph taken by, you know, the, the professional photographers. Um, similar photographs were published in the press because it was a positive, you know, like a positive interpretation, like these men could recover and France could recover through work and through, you know, professionalism and this kind of things. The, um, the men with facial injuries and disfigurement, they were extensively photographed at a medical level, but these photographs never reach the public, very rarely. Mm -hmm. um, Susanna Birnov has a really good article about um, disfigurement in British visual culture. Um, and she argues that that was basically invisible. In France, it was a bit different because they, um, they created their own society, they created their own journals, so they did a lot of like charities, and you could still see them, that they were not invisible at all. Um, but the, the photographs were not pushed into publications the way that the amputees were, because mm -hmm. the connotations were completely different. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And yeah. is it fair to say, that this was my reading uh, um that the the photographs of facial in injuries were almost used as instruction for doctors in in methods techniques for repairing these sort of war injuries is that is that the case yes yes yeah. so yeah. um they were extensively extensively photographed in in the medical context so they say in hospitals 
Um, so they took photographs of the whole procedure. So for, of the same soldier, you see several of them um, at the beginning when they arrive to the hospital, then after several procedures, just you kind of keep track of mm -hmm. what they're doing. Um, and all these photographs, well, they, they are a bit different depending on the hospital, but usually they're like this kind of mug shots, really focused on the face, um, nothing else going on, neutral background, yeah. um, just um, trying to get a focus on the injury. So it is difficult for that to translate into a different culture um, because it's done to highlight the damage rather than to um, to hide it or to put a positive spin on it. Yeah. Um, and I think it is, again, the function of the photographs rather than whether they're gross or not. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Because for instance, with the amputees, with the photograph that I have on the screen, I find it, it's, I think it's a really tough image it's not easy to digest that this man just lost an arm and they're having actual tools instead of it. Um, so I don't consider the photographs of um, facial injuries and disfigurement like more graphic than this. Um, it's not about being graphic, it's about how to use them in the public space. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> um, onto onto a, a different type of photo again and one that is also quite hard um uh, i was struck when i was reading your book that when i was thinking approaching it with my preconceived ideas of war photography obviously we're very familiar with hearing about the huge human toll of the great war and so i was surprised to learn that actual bodies do not feature centrally at all in war photography from this period uh, um, your figures are only between 0.3% and 0.5% of SPA photographers work d depicted the dead. And of these images, 60% were German bodies, not French bodies. So obviously, and, and John, you mentioned this in the chat, uh, the photographers were working with an eye on censorship standards. Um, but I found it so interesting to read the reasons why images of abandoned bodies were kept from the French public. And I wondered if you could talk us through that. Yes, sorry. Um, so this is the image um, of the abandoned body that probably you're talking about. So first of all, yeah, these um, so these figures come from uh, Veronique uh, Golubinov. <laughs> um, she did all the um, calculations. But yeah, so I find that really fascinating too. And I think um, the photography of bodies and especially photography of French bodies say a lot about the photographic project of the French military um, because on the one hand you have this um, this aim of documenting the war that everything that happens in the war needs to be recorded in the archives so the historian of the future can have an exact image of what happens so obviously you need to acknowledge the death of your own, the death of your own soldiers, um, and there are actually, you know, categories about that, um, and you can see, you know, and these unofficial photographs. So they 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 took these photographs, but on the other hand, and coming back to similar um, things from you know, and the previous photographs, it is difficult to take these photographs in a way that fit into the discourse of the French military that they want to um, they want to keep in the archive, um, and that is where the abandoned bodies feature. So, um, in this photograph, as you can see, it's one taken by uh, an official photographer. His name was uh, Albert Albert Samamatikli. His um, all the photographs from the official photographers are anonymous, but if you look at like their serial number, um, you can know who was a photographer. Um, and this was taken in Verdun um, after the main um, after the main battles. So as you can see, there's one body in the terrain next to a crater full of water, 
and there is a truck and two soldiers coming by next to it. So just visually, the image is not especially graphic. Like I find, again, the previous photograph with the prosthetic tools more violent than this one. Um, the body, it's just there. It's not even, there's not even like um, an emphasis on the body because because of the colors and the terrain and the way it is portrayed um you might not even notice it mm -hmm. the problem is that this was taken the photograph was taken around two weeks after the main battles and the main confrontations which means that this body has probably been there for a couple of weeks if if not you know more or less we don't know and the two soldiers are coming next to it um you don't know if they're going to pick it up or not so that puts a really difficult issue um which is um not paying respect to death yeah you need to reassure the population that all the dead are going to be recovered and they're going to be um uh, buried and they're going to have a funeral or at least some honors and that you are going to have a grave to go to um, after the war. So the problem of abandoned bodies was a really common problem because obviously if battles don't end, okay, now we're done and it's easy to come by. There's usually like a bit of crossfire still. It's not always easy to get to the field um, right after that so in this kind of circumstances um, the photograph on the one hand reflects the values because it's a French body who died in the battlefield so it belongs to this mort à l'ennemi or mort pour la France this death by for France um, that um, the friend you know this kind of mention that the French give to their dead. But on the other hand, it is, you cannot publish this. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not because it is graphic, it's because of the problem of the abandonment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that explains also why many photographers didn't bother to take these photographs because they knew it was difficult for them to then do something with them. Yes. Um, yeah. So Sama Matikli, this photographer took a lot of them um, but I think because he just when he's on way, kind yeah. of yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. So it's it was a real morale issue, really, for people yeah. to see abandoned bodies, and and for that reason, there was such a small number of those photographs taken. Yeah, yeah. Even it, though that was the reality, <laughs> it was it it was such a practical issue mm -hmm. um, that. Um, yeah, I mean, there were journals that were just about this, about discussing mm -hmm. the best ways of burying bodies in the battlefield. Yeah. Whether incineration should work or not. It was it was a whole debate that obviously mm -hmm. happened only in the military and like technical spheres, like among like doctors and things like that, not in the public, because that was that's too much. Yeah. Um I know we had other questions to discuss, but I've got an eye on the time and okay. I've got lots of photo pho lots of photography, sorry, lots of comments and questions in the chat. So I wonder if I, I can put some of those to you. Um, is that OK? Yeah, perfect. So I've been asked, which I think is a lovely question. Uh, photography changed the course of the Vietnam War. Did First World War phot photography have a similar impact on the populace of any of the of the countries involved? Um, it's a bit of a big question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love these questions because it's like, okay, but they didn't matter in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it it didn't it didn't factor in like the result of the war, um, so it didn't have that result. But I think the main effect of photography is that it consolidated as a war, um, as a as a war, as a tool during the war and consolidated the power that it had during the war. 
So in previous wars, you know, in American Civil War, for instance, they use a lot of photography, but this is the first time that they use it at this scale. Like mm -hmm. all the magazines, all the journals publishing photo photographs, all the armies creating their own photographic services or hiring photographers. It's the first time that they realized that actually, you know, this, um, that images are weapons in their own way. Um, and I, and you see that, you know, in the, during the Spanish Civil War that explodes and obviously in the um, Second World War when you have all these war reporters and photojournalists as, as a thing. Um, so I think the main effect of First World War photography, it's this idea that photography belongs in war and it can do a lot mm -hmm. for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you. We have a couple of questions about um, war art, uh, war art, and war artists, and war photographers, and and whether their official purpose was different. I don't know if war art is something that you've, you know, <laughs> well versed in. <laughs> um, not really. <laughs> so I think um, so. It depends when we talk about photography again. What kind of photography we talk about mm -hmm. so obviously the official photography will be restrained by military others and what they want them to do while more personal photographs will be dictated by their own um their own desires and what they wanted to do things like that um so i think i think there was some you know, some people who did both, because obviously if you have like this artistic inclination, you might take photographs. Um, but definitely in the things that I've seen, well, there's, you know, what they're the main link in postcards. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. In postcards, they were extremely popular at the time, not just to send, but actually to collect. And for instance, I've seen um, personal albums that collect this kind of postcards about images and the scenes of the war, um, for instance, usually about the soldiers on leave meeting their fiance or this kind of ideas. So I think a lot of like artists will draw, you know, illustrate postcards. So mm -hmm. and and you can see clearly like some share visual codes between that. Yes. Yeah, so definitely some crossover there. Yeah. yeah. Um, we did touch on it a little bit, but I wanted to return to John Benjamin's question about censorship. Um, so what were the sort of rules that photographers had to try and follow? Okay, I think with censorship, that was a big thing. Um, but again, more important in theory than in practice. <laughs> um, so um, all these photographs taken by official photographers were sent to censorship, but censorship will mean that they cannot be published until the end of the war, mm -hmm. but they are kept in the archives. So actually that's only in relation to what the public can see, not what officials or even people years after the war will be able to see. It's, it's about limiting, um, the consumption of photographs during the war. So there's that, and for instance, some, I think um, the one that I saw about the body, um, the abandoned body that had that had been censored, but is still in the archives. Um, so journals also had to pass censorship, mm -hmm. um, and there are like some directions to it. And in fact, some of the journals that I've seen will have like a whole um, page with photographs in a blank space where it says we couldn't reproduce this photograph yeah so you can see that actually you know it was last minute um that that was forbidden but um so this French historian Joelle Bourrier and she has done a lot of work on that and she said that for instance some magazines sent their copies like really <laughs> At the, you know, with very little time, so um, censors couldn't really look into that. And mm -hmm. that was a way to kind of get away with it. Um, and from the point of view of the taking of the photographs for official photographers, 
they gave some instructions but really vague like it was impossible to implement them Mm -hmm. you know um in a way that didn't fit with the guidelines it was all in the national interest and things like that it was super vague so they could do whatever they want really yeah oh that's (laughs) interesting thank you (laughs) um We've got some really good questions. Thank you. Um, you can continue to send them in. We've got a few more minutes. We're gonna we're gonna close at eight. Um, so a few more minutes. Uh, so one's just come in was were these photographs taken on glass plates? And I, I remember you saying that the the vest pocket camera was not. That was on film, wasn't it? Um, but for some of the official photography, uh, if so, what was the survival rate for them at the time and subsequently? I.e., how many have survived from the number actually taken? Okay, great question. Love that. Um, so some of the, the official photographs were all taken in glass plates because um, they they had the whole system. Um, I think most, if not all of the glass plates have survived. Because, it's impressive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's also, it's the French bureaucracy. <laughs> it works really well um so the they had to send the the glass plates negatives to the labs and the archives and they kept that and even if the spa assad uh, was dissolving in 1919 it has kept you know transforming into different services so um at present the a ECPAD. <laughs> it is a, the similar um, organization that does that, and they have all the archives. They just so yeah. I think most have survived, and it's in the number of thousands. Probably. Wow, that's very impressive when you consider uh, where these photographs were taken and the journeys they might be. <laughs> Well, yeah, 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 but the, but yeah, obviously in other, um, you know, with with the um, amateur photographs, we just don't know. There's no way to know. Mm-hmm. And in other places where they were taking photographs, like in hospitals, for instance, um, all those glass plates have disappeared. Obviously, <laughs> that sure. no one care about that. Yeah. But in this case, because they had this archive. And they were really intentional about the archive. I think that's why it has survived. Brilliant. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, so a question about the reception of the fo- the photographs in the general public. Uh, did people, um, did they realize that like all news, uh, there, there was there was propaganda in the selection of which images were shared with the public? How, how were they received by, by the public? Um, yes, I mean, of course, <laughs> it was <laughs> um, it was propaganda, but that I think that is why, for instance, the uh, the new magazines that were that a lot of them were taped and created during the war. Um, that's why they tried to include photographs not taken by photojournalists or journalists in this case, or official photographs. They did a lot of contests for amateur photographs so they can send their own pictures um, as a way to get like, you know, like now you you, um, you post, you know, you, you rely a lot on social media when there's something happening on people there and uploading their pictures to Twitter, for instance. So it's yeah. a kind of a direct way to try to get to the action. Um, so I think that's, mostly how people try to react um i haven't looked into you know like attitudes of people in the reception of these photographs because it's a bit difficult to find exactly you know or make generalizations yeah um but yeah i think in general while there was this you know this idea that obviously it was propaganda it was an accepted form of propaganda. If yeah. that makes sense. Um, it's also interesting, interesting to look into what we mean by propaganda at the time. They're not, they're not outright lies. Mm-hmm. 
it's just a pretty version of reality if that makes sense yeah absolutely thank you um i'm just looking probably got time for one more picture um i've got so many in the private and the public chat so i'll just maybe just take the last one that's come in um so David asks, was the glass used in the plates just regular, prone to damage if not handled carefully, or was the glass treated in any way to make it more robust, being tempered, for example? I don't know. They don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that, that was a quick answer. There we yeah, go. <laughs> I, mean, I know that, you know, they all the photographers were professional photographers, that they were... Um, already working at the time and the labs that they used were already labs that they were using in other institutional contexts so um i don't know what to say about that but they were nicely done <laughs> <laughs> they, they, su they survived uh, they, we, yeah. <laughs> we'll sneak uh, we can in talk about that later <laughs> I will sneak in John John's question and then I'll wrap up. Uh, so John says, much was made of German atrocities. Was there any use of photos to vindicate this? Um, so that that's a really interesting question. So I haven't come across anything directly to related to the German atrocities because that's like early 1914, while photographs become more prominent, like more later um, later in the war. But um, one of the main topics of French propaganda was the photographs of German prisoners. Mm -hmm. And they always, always portray them like animals, like um, barbaric. Um, and they actually, you know, they describe them as animals. So, and in, against, you know, the civilization, the French civilization and the allies. Um, so I think that, always relates to the German atrocities because it's this depiction of, you know, it's it really like a herd of animals. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you refer that that is something that's discussed in your book. I'll do a final plug. I would really recommend buying Beatrice's book. It is a very very readable which is very unusual unusual with the with academic writing i'd say at a high level so thank you and thank, thank you so you. much for joining us um yes, it's been um, brilliant to have you thank you sorry i can just say one more thing i'm sure. gonna put my email um in the chat if you have any questions i've seen questions about um ethnicities and lgbtq um um history um in case of colonial troops that yeah a lot of them that's a different topic too um so if you have any questions just email me i'll do my best to answer <laughs> if you're happy could i put your e because i think the chat may disappear when i close but if you're happy for me to do so if i could put your email address in the email that i'll send out to all participants with the video link and survey that would be really great definitely yeah yeah yeah. just perfect i'm on twitter if not so lovely thank you thank you very thank much for coming and thank you everyone for joining us uh, thank if you, you. If you enjoyed tonight's talk, we have another one next Thursday with Dr. Kate Vigers, um, who will be discussing the true history of women of the special operations executive. So that promises to be great. But thank you so much, Beatrice. It's been a real pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank Bye. you. Bye.